So now we are moving on, and uh, I will hand over to Jeremy Land. I've already mentioned Jeremy. He and I met in Delphi a few years ago, then we met again in, uh, in California. Now he's here with us. For me, uh, he's one of the brightest minds thinking about the ecological civilization and putting all the threads together. I'm very happy to have you, Jeremy, and please take the floor. <laughs> Thanks so much. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> well, thank you, Alexandra, for that lovely introduction. And um, what an honor it is uh, to be here with everyone and to actually you know, start out this exploration that we're, we're all going to be engaged in in the next few days. And so, you know, we've already been looking at answers to some questions, right? Like, how to change your mind? Why, why are we even exploring that to change the world? And Alexander's been taking us through that. Why here in, in Delphi, Michael's been taking us through that. And when we look at this question of how to change our minds, to change the world, there are a couple of other questions that arise out of it that I'd like to explore with you all right now, which is, um, well, what are we changing from? And what might we change to, perhaps? And I'm not about to start laying out the answers to those questions, but I'm hoping in the next, in the next period of time that we'll have the chance to open up like a space for each of you and over the next couple of days with your shared collective imagination and our collective intelligence to begin to fill that space up with some pathways towards some of those answers. And so I'm, I'm going to be taking you through this um, sort of a, a bit of a, a presentation. If we have time at the end, you'll have to check with the, uh, Alexandra. Maybe we'll have a bit of a Q&A and a little bit of conversation about it. So if questions arise, reflections arise, hold them and hopefully you can share it with us. So we're going to be looking at envisioning an ecological civilization. But let's begin with that first question I just posed a minute ago. Well, where are we changing from? And maybe a good place to start with that is to contemplate the big picture, right? Earth, our only home. This beautiful planet here and in this dark, infinite space, the only place we know of in the universe right now where life exists. And on this incredible planet, life actually began to emerge quite early in the planet's lifetime, in fact, billions of years ago. And over those billions of years, uh, all kinds of um, it evolved to create this rich abundance that we all get to see and enjoy today. But only in the last couple of hundred thousand years did one particular species evolve that had the power to change the very Earth system itself, us Homo sapiens, of course. And if we ask ourselves, well, how are we doing with holding that power? Well, the answer we all know only too well right here in this room is, not very well. I don't need to tell anybody who lives here in Greece what we're looking at with the uh, harbingers of this daunting future with wildfires and floods um, and drought and all these other things that we all know are part, <coughs> are symptoms of this climate breakdown that we're facing, a climate emergency. <coughs> and I'm sure many of you are very familiar with some kind of chart that looks like this, right? Looking at our carbon emissions going up and up, <clears throat> and even if they stabilize, we're headed towards this catastrophic uh, three degrees or so rise by the end of the century because of these amplifying um, <clears throat> feedback effects. And we can see, you know, the radical changes needed to get just to two degrees, which has been said by scientists to be a prescription for disaster. But here's the thing. The, this climate emergency, drastic and terrifying as it is, is really only just a symptom 
of something even more profound that our human civilization has done to this earth. Basically, we expanded out <clears throat> to see that we are facing vast ecological destruction across the board. We're looking at <clears throat> a 69% decline in animal populations worldwide since just 1970 alone. We're looking at really the sixth great extinction of species, scientists are telling us, that humans have been kicking off. This would be the first um, extinction in Earth's history that was caused by the actions of a single species, us. We're looking at the annihilation of coral reefs worldwide, um, probably by the middle of this century on account of climate breakdown and the um, acidification of the oceans. And the UN tells us that 95% of Earth's land will be degraded by the middle of this century. But of all these statistics, the one that blows me away the most is this one that by 2050, at current rates, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. So how did we get to this place? Now, a few years ago, I wrote a book um, called The Patterning Instinct that <clears throat> is subtitled A Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning, where I looked at this question of how we came to this crazed, catastrophic place we're in right now. And one takeaway from that book is simply this, that culture shapes values, and values shape history, and by the same token, today's values will shape the future. So let's take a look at what are today's values. Well, there's a picture that to me seems kind of iconic of what today's values are, and it looks something like this. It's like, our, our dominant values are based on separation. Here are these kids lining up to get their food, separate from each other, connected to their technology, separate even from the food they're eating, not even thinking about where it might have come from. And if we look one level below that, we can see that there's like a modern story, basically of, of separation. It's a story that tells us that nature is a machine. It tells us that humans are separate from nature. It tells us that humans are essentially selfish and competitive, and that human progress arises from the conquest of nature. And as a result, the Earth is basically just a resource to exploit for human benefit. And underlying all this is the basic sense that, well, the purpose of life then in that case is just, well, to get wealthy and powerful, right? And this way of thinking is not one that actually um, is experienced by most cultures around the world throughout history, but it's one that emerged in early modern Europe. It's basically unique in the entire history of human thought. And it was really best expressed maybe by this uh, um, sort of um, seer, um, this clarion call of the scientific revolution, Francis Bacon, back in the 17th century in England, who said, we need to establish and extend the power of dominion of the human race itself over the universe, and then we can render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. And the Europeans took that call very seriously, and they applied it not just to nature, but of course other continents. And it led to the basically imperialism and colonialism in the world we have inherited today. And if we look at how that happened, we can see this worldview of separation led to two very um, profound logical consequences, seeing nature as a resource and seeing other people as a resource, which then led to the sense of human supremacy over the rest of nature, and for those white Europeans in Europe, white supremacy over every other kind of person um, existing on the earth, which led to fundamental values of extraction and exploitation. And those values underlie the current system we experience right now of global capitalism around the world. And that system has really taken over the world. And one way of looking at that is to recognize that of the 100 largest economies in the world today, 69 of them are not countries, but transnational corporations. 
And it's a system that's based on perpetual growth. A company isn't valued by what it's doing, it's valued by how much money it's expected to earn in the years to come. It's a system that is designed to mint billionaires, and it's done a great job of that. And it's led to the greatest inequality we've ever seen in history, where something like the wealthiest tw two dozen or so billionaires own as much wealth as half of the entire world's population. And it's also been incredibly successful in that extraction and exploitation. And scientists look at what's happened on consumption and production measures since the Second World War, and they call it the Great Acceleration. And one quick look at this picture, and you can see why. And it's projected to continue like this in decades to come, to triple that amount of consumption and production by about 2060, which is why scientists are telling us we're rapidly heading for a precipice. Some of you may be familiar with this, um, this kind of picture, which looks at our planetary boundaries. It's um, um, loads of scientists led by Johan Rockström um, have created this a way of looking at what are the, the safe operating space for humanity. Well, that safe operating space is that green circle in the middle there. And those orange bars are the amount by which we've broken through most of those planetary boundaries already, which is why scientists are putting out calls like this to the world, that soon it'll be too late to shift course away from our failing trajectory, that there's a very big risk we'll end our civilization. UN Secretary General Antonio Gutierrez calls it collective suicide. So is that where we're headed this century? Well, if we take a big view of history and look back from when humans first evolved, there have only been two or three major transitions in the overall experience of humans all around the world. We evolved as hunter-gatherers and spent 95 or more percent of our history as nomadic hunter-gatherers. And then roughly 10,000 years or so ago, um, agriculture emerged, which transformed um, over several thousand years, transformed the experience of virtually everyone in history. That's, in its different forms, that stayed relatively stable until the scientific revolution called in by Francis Bacon just a few hundred years ago, which once again has transformed everyone's experience. Most people who look at our current century from these perspectives agree we are undergoing an equally profound transformation this century, but where is it going to take us? Well, one scenario is the collapse that those scientists are warning us about. There's another scenario that's not spoken about too much, but maybe that is where we're headed for um, at current rates. And the reason why it's not spoken about too much is because in many ways, it's morally even more reprehensible than just collapse alone. And you might call it techno split or fortress world where the elites basically fortress up themselves, exploring new ways of being humans from transhumanism and um, uh, neurally, neural technologies, etc. while most people experience that split. But there is a third possibility, one that could actually stabilize where we're going, one that could lead not to collapse with that techno split, but to a path of sustainable flourishing. And that's what we're going to be exploring now for the next, uh, for the next little bit of time, what that might look like to move towards what people are calling an ecological civilization. Well, the first thing to get, a, get clear about having looked at what we've been seeing just now, is it requires changing not just a few incremental little things, making things a little better here or there, but changing the fundamental operating system of our civilization, from basically that extraction and exploitation to some kind of affirmation of life. So what is an, ecolo an ecological civilization? Well, that's something we're going to be like all of us and so many others around the world, answering together into the future. But we can recognize that it's a transformation in the basis of our global civilization, from one that's wealth-based to one that's life-based. Basically, it's a global, cultural, and economic system that would promote sustainable flourishing for humans and the Earth, with the overriding objective to create the conditions 
for all people to flourish as part of a thriving, living earth. And this is not just a vision that a few, a few people have sort of come together in some smoke-filled room and come up with. This is an emerging vision from diverse sources all around the world, from indigenous sources. Like some people might be familiar with some of these terms like Buen Vivir, Sumac Corsai, or Ubuntu from Africa. Um, from community sources like transition towns and theories of the commons, the degrowth movement, and agroecology spiritual sources, such as traditional Chinese principles, engaged Buddhism, Christian liberation theology, and political sources. So too many to name, like the like eco-socialism, the anti-globalization source, LGBTQ rights movements. But what, it, what this vision shares is this sense that maybe we can learn a bit from life itself as to how we redesign our civilization. If we look at ecosystems, we find um, that they actually uh, can exist for millions and millions of years healthy, resilient in the face of all kinds of changes, except, sadly, for those changes that we humans have been impacting them with. And so when we look at what has been life's secret for this, there are certain principles that we can look at that can be applied in some form or other to our own human civilization, and we'll take a look at those. But the basis of many of them is this realization that rather than from what we've been told, and most of us believe from mainstream culture that um, nature's selfish. We've all heard of the selfish gene, right? But actually, nature is not selfish like that. If we look back over billions of years, um, there's only been a few times in life's evolution where it like, jumped to greater complexity to, and ultimately to come to this abundance we enjoy today. And every one of those jumps to complex cells, multicellular life, simple animals and mammals, came about not from some species learning how to be more selfish, but from increases in cooperation where different species learned how to work together to create something better than what they had themselves. Life evolved through cooperation. In the words of systems biologist Lynn Margulis, it didn't take over the world by combat, but by networking. And so, one of these core principles we learned from that, life's great success is due to what biologists call mutually beneficial symbiosis, where each party gains from a reciprocal relationship. And if we think how that might apply in human terms, well, things like fairness, justice, equity, basically leading to individual dignity. If we look at nature, we also see that it's a holarchy meaning that each part of it, whether every cell, every mycorrhizal fungal network, every tree, is part of a greater whole. And if we take that notion of a holarchy and apply it to, uh, to human systems, we have a core concept that the health of the whole system, the health of the whole system requires the flourishing of each part, which is sometimes called fractal flourishing. Every ecosystem like, is incredibly diverse. Core principle, diversity, a system's health depends on two things, differentiation and integration. And so if we think of how that might relate to human society, something like the inherent right of each person and community to participate in cultural, political, and economic power. And then there's balance. Every part of an ecosystem through evolution evolved in a harmonious relationship with the entire system. Well, one simple way we can see that um, leading to our human civilization would be a steady state economy with equitable distribution of wealth and power. If you look at ecosystems, we find out there's not like some, some sort of ecosystem head honcho at the top telling each part of the ecosystem what to do, but there's the principle of subsidiarity, grassroots self-autonomy, where every part of that ecosystem does its own thing as part of that overall hierarchy. So think of that in human terms as pushing decision-making down to the lowest level possible in the system. Then there is embeddedness. 
Every part of that ecosystem is embedded in that system. So we can recognize humanity as being part of the natural world and tending Mother Earth rather than trying to control her. And then there is regeneration, the sense of sustainable flourishing into the long-term future, which was so well expressed by the Iroquois Confederacy in North America in their constitution when they said, in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven generations. So ultimately what that looks like is a transformation in values, an emphasis on quality of life rather than material possessions, right? Basing our political, social, and economic choices on a sense of our shared humanity with justice and dignity for all. Building civilization's future on the basis of symbiosis with the living earth where the flourishing of the natural world is foundational. And we see these values around the world and that we've basically inherited from our early nomadic hunter-gatherer ancestors. We see these values in Ubuntu and that, that great phrase, some of you may know um, the great word in Africa, which basically translates as, I am because you are. It was so well expressed by Albert Schweitzer, the set of values um, in the 20th century, who said, I am life that wills to live in the midst of life that wills to live. And as a result, I cannot but have reverence for all that is called life. That is the beginning and foundation of morality. And that would be the beginning and foundation of that different kind of life-affirming civilization. So I'm just going to take you briefly for a few minutes now, it's like what some of these principles, some of these kind of great ideas might actually look like in the real world. And again, these are just to kind of spark your imagination. None of these are answers in themselves, but they're just kind of ideas that so many different pioneers of these thinking, this thinking have already come up with. And just like Alexander was taking us through those, all those different um, six segments of the cube that are all interrelated. I'm separating these out in this way too, but in the, just the same way they're all interrelated, just like that. So first we'd be seeing a drastic reduction in global inequality. And that can come about through a number of means, one being through emphasizing um, worker-owned co-ops, like actually letting workers own um, their own production, which leads to a um, huge um, increase in fairness and equality. And, and the transnational corporations that now dominate our world, we'd look at them existing not just for shareholder returns, but existing for humanity. Now, some of you may be familiar with some of these um, leading ideas like benefit corporations or B corporations, where corporations can choose to have what's called a triple bottom line for people, planet, and profit. But they've had virtually no impact on the world as it is today so far. And because even though they're considering their decisions on all these different constituencies, they're a teeniest part of the overall economic system too. Because corporations, the big corporations, none of them have chosen it. But imagine a world where that triple bottom line was required for corporate charters, where they were fundamentally reorganized and their charters could only be renewed every five years or so, say, at the discretion of a panel that would be chosen by sortition, not just by whatever state regulators that go on the revolving door. So corporations could be subject not just to financial bankruptcy, but social or environmental bankruptcy. We'd be seeing an emphasis on the commons, which <clears throat> many of you may be aware is this, is this concept, oftentimes from the past, of the sustenance and well-being that hasn't yet been appropriated by private ownership or the states. And if we think about the commons, <clears throat> we can think of it and um, go all the way back from when Earth first began. Things that we all have a right to together, like the living Earth, atmosphere, water and sunshine. And then with early human history, things like language, cultural traditions, technology, that belongs to all of us, right? Then you've got things like writing, law, civilization, specialized knowledge, more recent um, history. And then in just the last hundred, or so years, electricity, industrialization, global markets, all this is our shared human heritage that's developed over 
all these millennia by life itself and the sweat and ingenuity of collective human work. And then just a recent few decades, couple of decades, microprocessors, computer code in the internet. When all this is created and then somebody comes along, does a few tweaks to this, what is available, what is really owed to all of us, and he creates something called Facebook and he gets a patent on it, right? And with that few tweaks, you have somebody whose net worth is now roughly a hundred billion dollars. And is that not maybe one of the greatest ex uh, existences of moral egregiousness in history when about half the world's population earn less than $5.50 a day, the minimum required for basic nutrition and normal life expectancy? But in an ecological civilization, that can be changed. We could recognize all of that as being the common wealth <clears throat> that actually is the moral right for every human being to have access to. How would they have access to it? Well, actually, this has been tried and tested and shown to work. Concepts like universal basic income, an unconditional monthly payment to every adult sufficient to meet their basic needs. Because it's been shown, rather than what we're told, that, oh, people are lazy, and if they, if they just have money like that, they'll not work, and they'll spend it on, on drugs and get addicted to things. Actually, purposeful work is an integral part of human flourishing, and uh, really it's a fundamental need for people to feel valued by their community. And programs that have applied this kind of thing consistently report a reduction in all those bads, like crime, child mortality, malnutrition, etc., and an increase in things like health, gender equality, school performance, and even entrepreneurial activity. All this would be part of a circular economy where products are designed for repair and recycling, sourcing from recycled materials with waste virtually eliminated. In the cities, we'd be looking at um, designed on permaculture, on ecological principles, community gardens on every block, um, energy efficient designs, cars banned from city centers, and essential services always within like a 20 minute walk of wherever you live in the city. Out in the countryside, we could be looking at agroecology, replacing global industrial monocrops based on principles of permaculture and regenerative agriculture, which lead to greater biodiversity, carbon efficiency, um, elimination of synthetic fertilizer, and it's been shown to be as productive as industrial agriculture without those devastating effects. In technology, Alexandra was saying, we can embrace technology, but rather than it being owned, the centralized control by these massive corporations, it can be distributed where control is actually pushed down to all of us, which there is incredible experiments going on right now about different ways to empower and basically protect collective action, enabling people to cooperate at scale. We'd measure this civilization, not by gross domestic product, which just basically measures how quickly we're consuming the earth and turning human activity into this monetized economy. But there's measures out there already, such as a genuine progress indicator, which factors in negatives and positives that lead to real well-being rather than this kind of false understanding. Going out to our culture, we'd be <coughs> moving from patriarchal domination that's been the story of most cultures for thousands of years to um, partnership systems, beautifully described by uh, the writer Ria and Isla that many of you may know of, about going to a partnership system with, um, which really values mutual respect with stories and that put high value on cooperation, on empathic and caring relationships. On the global scale, we could be looking at things like a muscular United Nations with enforcement powers over the global commons. And maybe, just like we have a, um, a human rights declaration, a rights of nature declaration that would put the natural world on the same legal standing as humanity. Ultimately, what we're looking at is building a planetary consciousness. And that, just the way nature works, according to hub and spoke networks, similarly, we'd have a place-based identity with a local community focus, face-to-face -face interactions, and citizen action networks, building trust 
an agency. And we'd have a planetary consciousness with things like Facebook converted to the public commons so we can all use it together to build that sense of cosmopolitanism, that global citizenship and celebrating diversity while recognizing our deep interdependence. Ultimately, what we're looking at is humanity becoming a connected superorganism. Essentially, going to the place where there's an emergent self-organized collective intelligence where over the long term, we can begin to see ourselves and the living earth not as separate, but as part of an integrated whole. Many of you are familiar with this notion that we've now entered the Anthropocene after 10,000 years of a, of a lovely Holocene period. And the Anthropocene period um, basically is the result of the ideology of human supremacy, um, where our human impact reaches geological pre proportions, is destructive of life and biodiversity, and it's inherently unsustainable. But could this ecological civilization that maybe we could turn to, could it become a gateway to a totally different era of the Earth, what some have called the symbiocene, based on that principle of symbiosis. Imagine a period of mutually beneficial flourishing of humans and the living Earth, where we use technology for regeneration, for life-affirming practices. And maybe this period could be very long-lived. Maybe we could be a civilization learning how to tend Mother Earth. So thanks for listening to that. This is this um, shared vision by so many people that opens up the space for us to explore now in these next couple of days all that is possible as different pathways to move towards that vision that's available there to all of us. And if anyone, by the way, is interested in uh, like continuing to be part of this global discussion. There's a network that's just arisen in the last couple of years called the Deep Transformation Network, which is dedicated to exploring these pathways toward an ecological civilization. So thank you for that. Let me turn to Alexandra right now. Just stay for a second. Thank you, Jeremy. You know, for me, listening to you the first time, it sort of put many things together. I knew that change was coming from the bottom up. I had seen people all over the world getting involved in the common good projects, and, uh, but I couldn't really make sense in this, the way you make it. But I can tell you one thing. What Jeremy showed now about what is happening around the world is true. It is happening. And I think you said somewhere that while the industrial revolution was taking place, there was a lot of disruption. There were many people losing and others gaining. Some were adapting and some were not. Nobody was calling it the industrial revolution because you didn't have the distance. I can assure you, and this is why I'm so positive and optimistic, that right now in the world, all those movements exist. They are happening. And we are probably already in the midst of the ecological revolution. We just don't see it. We just don't understand it. This is why we need an analysis like this. And believe me, it is very helpful to get this big image because we really trust that we go in that direction. And in any case, and I will finish with this, we don't have a choice we will need to change. So either we change actively and we are part of it, or we don't change actively and we're just the victims of it. So I'm very, very sorry because I was told by up there that there's no time for questions. I want to thank you deeply. I want also to say one last thing about something we use a lot at the World Human Forum. We talk about the two AIs. At the time of artificial intelligence, we need ancestral intelligence. And Jeremy, you told me a year ago that we need a third AI, which is animate intelligence, which is nature's intelligence. And from now on, the World Human Forum will speak about three AIs, because this is what we really need. So thank you very much. And handing over to Gina. Thank you. Thank you.